There is a land in Asia quite unlike any other. For centuries, a warrior people have attempted to defend it at all costs. It has been one of the most dangerous places in the world and at times was host to some of the most dangerous people in the world. This is a place where terrorists go to school, where an ongoing jihad over a decade long is just the latest in a series of jihads that are over a decade long. We're talking about Waziristan. Now, some of you might never have heard of it, as it is just a small section of a formerly semi-autonomous region on the Afghan border. There are so many questions that a place like Waziristan stirs up. Who are the people defending this land? Why do extremists flock to it like a moth to a flame? And how has a line on a map drawn in the 19th century led to thousands of deaths, war, and suffering? Well, you're about to find out, because this is just about everything you need to know about Waziristan. Waziristan is an area around 11,585 square kilometers or 4,500 square miles in size. It sits on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan in the northwest of Pakistan. This border is known as the Duran Line from back when the UK colonized India in the 19th century. Waziristan's territory roughly lies between the Gomor River in the south and the Karam River in the north. However, the entirety of Waziristan itself is also split in half administratively, creating what is known as South and North Waziristan. That's not all, though. Waziristan was originally part of the FATA, or Federally Administered Tribal Areas, in Pakistan, a semi-autonomous tribal region that existed from 1947 until 2018 when it was merged with the neighboring province of Khyber Pakhtunakhwa. Much like its western neighbor Afghanistan, Waziristan is particularly mountainous. Hills gradually rise from the east to the west until they reach staggering peaks over 3,000 meters, that's 9,000 feet, in the southern half of the region. The northern half is less mountainous and more open, but it has large hills and vast valleys, perfect for guerrilla warfare. Having pretty hostile terrain is a double-edged sword in politics. The more rugged the landscape, the less likely you are to be successfully invaded. This is something that Afghanistan next door knows so well. However, that protection comes at a cost, and Waziristan's economic development is inhibited as a result. Open Data Pakistan tells us that maize, fruit, and wheat are the major crops, with some sugar and rice to supplement that. However, recent patterns of erratic weather, droughts, and a lack of water infrastructure or the capital to build have resulted in an agricultural downturn in recent years. 90% of Waziristan's population are associated with the agricultural sector. In other words, Waziristan, as an area, has always been one of little economic development. The people there live out a meager existence, and the agricultural downturn has only made the situation worse. They are at the whims of the weather, like any substantial agricultural population. Today's episode is brought to you by one of my favorite sponsors, and that is Vessi, who make the most fantastic shoes that you will ever wear. These are the new Courtside Classics by Vessi. Uh, brand new pair of shoes. Just like all Vessies, they are 100% waterproof, and that's thanks to the material they're made out of called Dymatex. You can go splashing through puddles. You can basically go up to here, and your socks will remain perfectly dry. It's just water goes on, and then it comes off. It's pretty amazing stuff. I've been wearing Vessies for two, three years now. However long I've been working with them, and I basically don't wear any other shoes because they are super comfortable. They are waterproof. You can wear them all year round. And, and waterproof doesn't mean, like, your feet are going to get sweaty. The, the Dynamatex material that they use means that they're waterproof, but still breathable somehow. It's really good. You never even notice. They're good for summer, winter, whatever time of year. Make the most of city life with vintage style comfort sneakers, the Courtside Classic. Discover more fantastic styles at vessi.com forward slash places. Get your pair today to get an automatic 15% off your first purchase at checkout, and you'll stay cool and you will stay dry. Huge thanks to Vessi for sponsoring today's video, and now back to it. The Pakistan Bureau of statistics states that there is just short of 1.6 million people living in Waziristan. The majority of the tribes living there are Pashtun, meaning they speak the Pashto language similar to their Afghani neighbors, although they do speak a specific Waziri dialect. The most populous tribe is the Wazirs, for which the area is known. There are also the Mesuds, Bitanis, and Dawars, among other smaller tribes as well. Pakistan is already a highly Islamic country, and Waziristan is no different. They adhere to Sunni Islam, and specifically the Hanafi school of thought, as well as Pashtunwali, the traditional tribal code which facilitates their society. That is to say, as Muslims go, many in Waziristan are on the conservative side of things and follow a pretty strict code in accordance with their tribal culture bolstered by Islam. However, whilst many will know of Waziristan owed to the current war on terror and the coalition invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the people who populate Waziristan have a long and sordid history with colonists. So, 
Let's go back a few centuries, shall we? To understand the history of Waziristan, you have to go back further than the history of Pakistan as a nation and delve into the history of India. India at the time of British colonization in the 19th century included the territories now known as the countries of Bangladesh and Pakistan. In 1806, Shah Abdulaziz Mahadith Dawale declared Dar ul Harb, meaning abode of war, on the British in India. He asserted in his fatwa that Muslims in then India should revolt against the British for freedom, equality, and justice. He also asserted that Muslims should be the de facto leaders of India after the British were expelled. As a result, Shah Abdulaziz is seen as one of the earliest proponents of Indian independence. Even as far back as over 200 years ago, you can see Muslims in the subcontinent willing to fight to establish self-determination. This parallel from past to present shows that the surviving remnants of Islamic fundamentalism in Waziristan today strongly link back to hundreds of years of history. It goes some of the way in explaining how this fundamentalism has defined the area for at least two centuries. Two wars were fought between Britain and Afghanistan in the 19th century owed to the geopolitical game of chess that the British Empire was playing against Russia to see who gained de facto control of Afghanistan. This geopolitical posturing continued until 1893, when Afghanistan's Abdur Rahman Khan and Britain's Sir Henry Mortimer Durand agreed to delineate the border between what was then Afghanistan and British India. With a few strokes of a pen, the Durand Line was born. Much like other British lines on maps at the time, it cut directly through local villages and divided communities which would eventually lead to disaster years down the line. Who would have known? Waziristan just happened to be just on the British India side, with the border's existence separating Pashtun families living across the line to this day. When the British entered Waziristan, they halved it into its northern and southern parts and set up administrative headquarters in Wana and Miransha, where local command centers remain to this day, even though the British are long gone. The British also introduced a land record system and revenue administration for the region. However, peace between Afghanistan and Britain simply couldn't last, and skirmishes over the border began almost immediately, with Britain not completely restoring order until 1901. The British time in Waziristan was immensely difficult, with different mountain tribes revolting against the British on a consistent basis until 1919, when the leader of Afghanistan was assassinated. Afghani troops then crossed the border into Waziristan, and thus the Third Anglo-Afghan War began. Along with their Muslim and Pashtun brothers in Afghanistan, the tribes also rose up in rebellion. The fighting was so brutal that the British required the use of enormous firepower to reassert control over the plucky region by 1920 and eventually stationed a permanent garrison in Ramzak in 1923. This move would prove to be something of a strategic blunder, as the garrison was an easy target for attacks. In the 1930s, there was more unrest and violence, as Mizali Khan, a member of the Wazir tribe and also known under the title of Fakir of Ippi, declared jihad against the British. The tribesmen rallied around Khan and started a guerrilla war against British colonial troops, where many on both sides lost their lives. In the 1940s, violence was still common, but had reduced a lot in conjunction with Britain reducing the size of the garrison at Ramzak. Khan would harass the British until they left British India in 1947. In 1947, Khan, alongside his allies straddling the Durand Line, declared the Banu Resolution. The resolution demanded that the Pashtuns be given a choice to have an independent state of Pashtunistan composing all Pashtun majority territories of British India. Instead, the Pashtuns uh, were given the choice to join Pakistan during its process of becoming an independent nation, or India, which wasn't majority Muslim. Khan and his allies were ultimately ignored, and all of Waziristan, as well as all the other British Indian Pashtun territories, joins the newly formed nation of Pakistan without an option to join Afghanistan or to create Pashtunistan. Khan refused to recognize Pakistan and launched a campaign against the new state, but it petered out by 1954 when his commander-in-chief Dil Khan Khatak surrendered to Pakistani authorities. Khan himself died of natural causes in 1960, never being captured or killed. Pakistan was now a nation, and the federally administered tribal areas, FATA, including modern Waziristan, uh, was established for the tribes to live semi-autonomously but under Pakistani rule. The Pakistanis kept much of the British administrative infrastructure, including keeping both North and South Waziristan's provincial capitals where they were. However, not everybody was happy with the arrangement. As we mentioned, the Fakir of Ippi was one such actor who never approved of Pakistani rule. Despite Pakistan's foundation as a Muslim nation, Islamic fundamentalists living between Afghanistan and Waziristan have been trying to establish their own conservative brand of Islamic rule ever since. 
that displays the long-standing connection between Waziristan and Afghanistan, regardless of the Durand line dividing them. So when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, hundreds of thousands of Afghanis crossed the border into Pakistan. This in turn caused a crisis within Pakistan, who were struggling to establish themselves on the world stage after fighting two wars with Big Brother India. Pakistan's border on the Afghanistan side was very porous, allowing many people through because of the hostile terrain, a theme that has continued into the modern day. The Pakistani government extended extensive support to the Afghan Mujahideen under President Zahal Haq, which in turn allowed the United States to support Pakistan and the Mujahideen by proxy because they were resisting Soviet conquest in Afghanistan. The Pakistanis, in conjunction with the US, used extremism to attempt to destabilize Soviet Afghanistan in what was known as Operation Cyclone. During this time, Waziristan acted as a safe haven for foreign Mujahideen from Central Asia. It was common during the Soviet-Afghan war for foreign Islamic fundamentalists to use Waziristan as a launching pad for attacks into Afghanistan. This was likely due to a few factors. The establishment of the Central Asian Mujahideen in the FAPA during the Soviet-Afghan war, the proximity of Afghanistan to Waziristan and the region being semi autonomous meant that Islamabad did not have full control over the area and therefore had plausible deniability. As a result, Waziristan became something of a staging ground and a breeding ground for extremist Islamic ideas. The Tariq e Taliban Pakistan, otherwise known as the Pakistani arm of the Taliban, would go on to be founded in Waziristan in 2002. Now, we've gone through all that history at quite the pace there. To show you, the region of Waziristan is founded in fundamental Islamic rebellion and resistance against large powers. The people who live there make up a diverse group of warriors who are used to the harsh terrain and mountainous regions and are well-versed in guerrilla warfare. They are staunchly supportive of their Pashtun brothers in Afghanistan and are willing to take up arms to defend their faith. So when the USA invaded Afghanistan in 2001, what did they think was going to happen? On September the 11th, 2001, two planes struck the World Trade Center towers in New York City, killing 3,000 people. The majority of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, but Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda were deemed to be the ultimate cause by U.S. lawmakers, as the hijackers were members of the terrorist organization. In the same year, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, beginning what became known as the War on Terror. In a cruel twist of fate, the Pakistani and US-backed Islamic fundamentalists that fought the Soviets, including the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden, had turned the jihad back on them. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. In 2004, the US had pushed the fundamentalists into the mountains in the eastern side of the country whilst hunting al-Qaeda leaders. In particular, the fighting was taking place in the Tora Bora Caves, also known as the Black Caves. This was during the final stages of the US's planned portion of the invasion. Of course, we all know that the US went on to stay in Afghanistan for over two decades. During this time, the US was also putting pressure on Pakistan to do something about the fundamentalists in their country, given the prevalence of extremists using Waziristan as a staging ground or a place to escape to. Under this pressure in 2004, the Pakistani army entered the Khyber district just south of Waziristan for the first time since Pakistan's independence in 1947, later pushing into both southern and northern Waziristan itself. However, this presented a difficult situation for Pakistan, as many people in the tribal areas are Pashtun, so they are staunchly Islamic, and many of them disagreed with the USA's invasion of Afghanistan. By extension, many more were unhappy with the Pakistani army entering their semi-autonomous territory in support of a US initiative. They saw it as a stab in the back of their Pashtun brothers. Other areas in Pakistan had seen protests also, accusing the United States of imperialism and Pakistan of being its lackey. General DeLong, the second in command during the US invasion of Afghanistan, stated in his memoir that, quote, to make matters worse, this tribal area was sympathetic to bin Laden. While DeLong initially said this in relation to the Tora Bora and attempted capture of bin Laden in 2001, some Waziristanis would have inexplicably felt the same in 2004. That does not mean that Muslims in Waziristan agreed on everything, though, and large-scale fighting between the tribal populations and foreign militant groups would break out from time to time. The Pakistani incursion into Waziristan erupted into conflict in the White Mountains of South Waziristan on the 16th of March 2004. The White Mountains are closely associated with the Black Caves of Afghanistan. The town of Wana sits in this area and is where the majority of the fighting took place with reports of at least 500 al-Qaeda fighters holed up in the region at the time. It was also reported that foreign elements, including Tajiks, Chechens, and Uzbeks were there. Now, we don't say this to point fingers and blame any one specific people for the fighting, but we want to show how much of a hotbed for foreign Islamic militancy Waziristan had become in the wake of the War on Terror. After the battle, man-made tunnels in Waziristan that led back to Afghanistan were found, showing how militants would use them to transit between both countries. 
This too would become a theme of stateless actors in the region. Foreign militants were so comfortable holding Waziristan as a staging ground, it was even later discovered that Tahir Yaldashev, the leader of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, or IMU, was present in Waziristan at the time. On the 28th of March 2004, he was wounded in an attack by the Pakistani army before escaping, likely in one of the many tunnels. Despite conflicting reports of whether Yaldashev survived the attack, he would later be confirmed as deceased as a result of a US airstrike in South Waziristan in 2009. The IMU is a terrorist organization that was known for the numerous attacks it had claimed throughout Central Asia before later finding home in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And just to make it clear whose side these guys are on, they later pledged allegiance to ISIS. However, these were not the only terrorists in Waziristan, as the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Haqqani Network, among other less well-known fundamentalist groups, would all find home in Waziristan at times throughout the 21st century. The US was watching the fighting closely. The project on government oversight, an American nonpartisan national security watchdog, stated in its Center for Defense Information in 2004 that after intense fighting, 55 Al Qaeda fighters were killed alongside 49 of the Pakistani army, plus purportedly an unconfirmed large number of Al Qaeda members captured. This kicked off the unofficial conflict known as Pakistan's War on Terror. The fighting was intense across the whole western side of Pakistan. Over the coming years, three districts in the federal tribal areas were captured by militants and were under their de facto control, that being the Bajar district, South Waziristan, and North Waziristan. In 2005, Pakistan was able to arrest several high-profile al-Qaeda members, including Abu Faraj al-Libi, who was a top general for al-Qaeda at the time. However, the capture of high-profile militants did little to quell the violence. Several ceasefire agreements were made in 2006 and 2007 between the Pakistani government government and tribal leaders known as the Waziristan Accords. However, it was a hollow peace, and the violence continued, often motivated by US and Pakistani military involvement in the area. Throughout this time, attacks, raids, and suicide bombings were still relatively frequent. In Waziristan itself, there was a collapse into infighting. According to the BBC, by April of 2007, the local tribal population had successfully pushed the foreign militants, mostly Uzbeks, out of the valleys surrounding Wana. This resulted in the defeat of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and the tribes regaining some control over the landscape. However, the IMU were not the only ones operating in Waziristan at the time. As we've mentioned, Al-Qaeda were already present in the area, and 2007 was when the Pakistani arm of the Taliban, the TTP, began to rise in prominence, already by this time in control of many parts of Waziristan. For Waziristan, this would not be the end of militants in their lands or the bloodshed that the region had become almost synonymous with. Fighting was bound to erupt again. Waziristan was a powder keg, and all it needed was a spark. That spark came in July of 2007. In the city of Islamabad, over 300 kilometers away from Waziristan, what started out as clashes between militant student supporters and police at the Lal Masjid Mosque led to it being sieged by police and armed forces. Despite the Muslim League's attempts to quell the violence, it fell on deaf ears, with the siege lasting for eight days, only being lifted to assault the mosque. Over 100 people were confirmed killed in the attack, but others have reported it as being a much higher death toll. Pakistan's Interior Secretary Syed Kamal Shah told reporters that, quote, it is believed that some women and children holed up in the mosque lost their lives in the military operation against militants. However, no official numbers for the amount of innocent people killed was ever released. The Siege of the Red Mosque, as it is known, sent the shallow truce of militants in Waziristan into a tailspin. Even during the eight-day siege itself, there were several attacks in Waziristan as retaliation. That's not all, though. This was something of a watershed moment for Pakistan. It represented the catalyst that would cause widespread violence in northwest Pakistan to once again break out. This move that killed innocent Muslims among militants in a mosque was simply the straw that broke the camel's back, and this formally put an end to any peace agreements between Pakistan and its fundamentalists. The Waziristan Accords were dead. It was open season. Under pressure, Pakistani President General Pervez Musharraf moved a large swath of the Pakistani army into Waziristan, totally abandoning all principles of their semi-autonomous governance in the name of law and order. Fierce clashes with militants began. There were so many attacks by militants in Waziristan that it would be impossible to cover them all in this video. One of the most famous attacks covered by the Long War Journal was an incident where the TTP successfully captured over 100 security forces personnel after intercepting a military convoy in August of 2000. 300 people had been killed by attacks, mostly suicide bombings, by October. Between the tribal militants and their tensions with the foreign militants, the Pakistani security forces entered the region and, with the occasional airstrike from the USA, it was bedlam. However, the militants were able to take advantage of the chaos. In January of 2008, militants had overrun a Pakistani fort, one of many which scattered the landscape in Waziristan. 
Nevertheless, this goes to show how much of a fighting force the militants in Waziristan were at this time. They were strong, they had numbers, weapons, connections, escape routes, logistics, and most importantly of all for them, faith. The TTP had almost total control of both North and South Waziristan by 2008. The Pakistani army, now under new management since President Musharraf's resignation in 2008, began the painstaking process of clearing, holding, and building on the bordering areas of Waziristan to regain control. The army used the staging time as preparation for a major military offensive into South Waziristan, known as ra e nijat which arrived in October of 2009. This was the first time since the conflict began that the Pakistani army truly had the numbers advantage over the smaller pockets of militants as they sent 28,000 troops into South Waziristan from three directions. The Pakistani army was able to take back several towns and installations within South Waziristan, including the fort they had lost the year prior. However, with an estimated 10,000 militants in Waziristan at the time, there were not many captured or killed. The CTC also reported the potential reasons for this, stating, overall, there is little evidence that heavy fighting occurred during the entire operation because it appears that most militants fled in the face of the government advance. This reflects the guerrilla war tactics that the various militants in Pakistan used at the time. It's not out of the question that the militants, especially high-profile terrorists, would use the tunnel network in Waziristan to escape back into Afghanistan, where they could then stage counterattacks from. This is the true difficulty of fighting a stateless actor on the border of two states. There is always a place to run. Despite this, however, the Pakistani army had declared victory in South Waziristan by December of 2009. The fight had continued in other areas across Western Pakistan, but South Waziristan went quiet for a considerable period, given the army's occupation there. In 2010, plans were drawn up for a full-fledged military invasion of North Waziristan, the last militant holdout. However, this wouldn't come to fruition until four years later in 2014. The Pakistani brass had to be patient. They had already taken back South Waziristan and would go on to hold it. Now, it was time for the North. It couldn't come at a worse time for the Pakistani Taliban, the biggest militant fighting force in Waziristan at the time. In 2014, the TTP collapsed into infighting, with one faction splitting completely away from the TTP, claiming the leader's tactics were un-Islamic. Now, not only were the TTP weaker and less organized, but the Pakistani army were standing on their doorstep, waiting for an imminent invasion order. Tens of thousands of people were killed in the seven years since the TTP's rise to prominence. For this reason, the Pakistani army were not going to hold back as they had been emboldened and battle-hardened fighting against guerrilla militants on and off since at least 2004. On the 8th of June, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan attacked Jinnar Airport in Karachi with RPGs and gunfire, resulting in the deaths of 34 people. This was not the time to poke the hornet's nest, and the Pakistani army responded with a great show of force. As a result of the attack on Jinnar Airport, Operation zab e azab was launched a week later on the 15th of July. Similar to Operation ra e nijat around 30,000 soldiers pushed into North Waziristan to flush out the remaining militants, staging attacks, and training soldiers there. The operation was, militarily speaking, a roaring success. Despite the deaths of 347 Pakistani soldiers, that proved to be the cost for killing 2,763 militants, capturing over 18,000 weapons, and destroying over 800 hideouts in return. The number of total fatalities within FATA declined from 2,863 in 2014 to just 1,862 in 2015. This is equivalent to a year-on-year -year casualty reduction of over 36%. However, there were other costs for this success. In terms of finances, Zab e Abbas cost over $1.3 billion. Even for a successful operation, that is pretty darn expensive. If you wanted to extrapolate it out, Pakistan spent $470,000 per militant killed if those numbers are accurate. There's also something to be said about the half million people who were displaced by the conflict. Many people who lived in Waziristan had no home to return to, owed to the damage that was caused by the fighting. Many who have tried to return home had no running water or electricity for at least six years after the operation. And then there's the question of whether the operation actually worked. Yeah, a reduction in violence in total terms is good. That is an unequivocal success of Zab e Abbas. But one could argue that all this operation did was kick the can down the road. It treated the symptom, not the cause. It hadn't eradicated extremism in Waziristan or in Pakistan more widely. In 2007, militant Islamic fundamentalist attacks continued, just less frequently. Pakistan's porous border with Afghanistan was still a major issue. Despite Operation Zab e Abbas driving out the militants from their strongholds in North Waziristan, it isn't out of the question that many high profile militants escaped back into Afghanistan and simply waited for the heat to die down before re entering Pakistan. So without fixing the root cause, they were unable to change the root effect. 
This is how the conflict was in Waziristan and across Pakistan up until recently. A low-intensity conflict where attacks continued and the Pakistani government continually failed to stamp extremism out of the region once and for all. Pakistan passed their 25th Amendment in May of 2018, officially federating FATA into the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region. This officially abolished semi-autonomy in the region and bestowed its inhabitants with the rights guaranteed by Pakistani citizenship. This was likely done to give the Pakistani government more say and influence over the region and allowed them to keep a closer eye on it and the border with Afghanistan. And speaking of the border, a border fence between Pakistan and Afghanistan was built and mostly completed by 2021. In theory, this border fence would stop those who wished to cross the border from one nation to the other. Crucially, it would stop cross-border attack and retreat tactics by guerrilla militants. Those who staged attacks successfully would struggle to escape whilst being hunted by Pakistani forces. Now, in the simplest sense of walking across the land, that's true. However, as we well know by now, militants in this region don't tend to travel over ground, or rather underground. It is highly unlikely that Pakistan is able to do anything about the extensive network of caves and tunnel systems that link it to Afghanistan, which means the border is, by default, semi-open. On September the 5th, 2020, a terrorist on a bomb-clad motorcycle targeted a Pakistani army convoy on the Mastong Road in Quetta, killing four personnel and injuring 20 others. The Pakistani Taliban have since claimed responsibility for this incident, showing the fence can only have so much of an effect when there are already extremists in your borders. However, some effect is no effect. The number of cross-border attacks into Pakistan from Afghanistan fell from 82 in 2019 to just 11 in 2020, although the pandemic could also have some effect on this. The fence has its drawbacks. It separates families from their relatives who live on the other side of the border. It also calls into question the border itself, which Afghanistan disputes owed to the Pashtun peoples in northwest Pakistan and could potentially be the reasoning behind a direct state conflict between Pakistan and Afghanistan in the future. Finally, the fence acts as a target for militants on the Afghan side of the border. A mortar shelling of a Pakistani border town in 2022 killed 17 people. In 2021, the fate of Waziristan once again changed direction for the worse as the US pulled out of Afghanistan after two decades. Within months, the Taliban had taken back control of the country. This posed a new challenge for Waziristan, as despite the fence and the operation to drive fundamentalist militants out of Pakistan, the Taliban no longer needed a staging ground in Pakistan as all of Afghanistan was now their staging ground. Not only this, but the Taliban in Afghanistan were armed with more resources and equipment than ever, considering the $7 billion worth of stuff that was left behind by the US. In 2023, US arms were already finding their way into other conflicts, including Pakistan's ongoing three-way Kashmir conflict alongside India and China. Therefore, Pakistan now has the Taliban more well-equipped than ever on its porous border, with no real way of totally stemming the infiltration of terrorists, guns, and radical ideals into their country. The Taliban's triumph in Afghanistan has regalvanized the Pakistani Taliban, who now have a state-sized ally to support their operations, as well as a safe haven to stage attacks from. It's no surprise, then, that Pakistan's caretaker, Prime Minister Anwar ul Haq Kakar, has said the number of terrorist incidents in Pakistan has increased by 60% in November of 2023. There is simply only so much a fence can do. Waziristan today, in a way, is how it has always been, an unstable region balancing on a knife edge with many internal and external actors trying to influence it as it rebuilds itself. No matter who is in charge of the region, it appears to remain a place where fundamentalist Islamic ideologies are bred and trained. You only need to see the 2017 pictures posted by the BBC of defunct bomb factories in North Waziristan to understand the entrenchment of these radical ideas in the region. Northern Waziristan specifically remains a target for attacks, such as when a girl's private school was blown up there on the 10th of May 2024 with zero casualties. The peril of the people who live near the Durand Line has spanned centuries. Generations of people have been blown up, shot, injured, radicalized, invaded, colonized, and displaced. It makes you wonder whether it would have been better for the Pashtun people to be given what they wanted back in 1947, a national homeland. The drawing and subsequent following of the Durand Line has led to misery, war, and jihad so long-spanning that it is still affecting global geopolitics today. Could all of that bloodshed have been avoided? Could more still be avoided? The cynical answer is it's unlikely to change now. Despite Afghanistan's dispute over the border, the Durand Line is an internationally recognized border by most of the world. 
As a result, it is unlikely to change anytime soon, which means Taliban-run Afghanistan will sustain an influence over the northwest of the country, and so attacks from the TTP will continue, bolstered by support from abroad. One thing is for sure, though. No matter what happens to the land of Waziristan, the people who live there are warriors and survivors, and they will be ready.